from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data SV 2016. Now your host, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for the Q special presentation of Big Data SV in conjunction with Strata Hadoop. It's Big Data Week here in Silicon Valley and we have the companion New York City we did earlier in the year and then now in Silicon Valley we go, we talk to all the smartest people around Big Data and Joel Horwitz is here, strategy and business development executive at IBM Cube alum. Welcome back. Thanks guys. Things are rocking and rolling. You, do, you did a lot of work as a developers. Now you got an increased role at IBM, a yeah. little bit broader scope because you know the, the world is going cloud, it's, you, you guys got Bluemix, a lot of things yep. going on with analytics, Watson. So IBM is taking a different approach than say some of the other vendors because you get the weather company, who buys the weather company, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of good stuff, but it's a different approach. What's the update? I mean, because data is still the heart of it, big time for you guys. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, Doug Cutting said it very well this morning. Um, I don't know if you caught his uh, keynote over across the way, but, um, you know, he described, you know, it, we've been, you know, working with Hadoop for the past 10 years. And what he described was it's a really, it's an enabling technology. And, you know, in the past 10 years, um, things have changed quite a bit for Hadoop. We have better hardware um, that's leaning more now into memory as opposed to, to disk. We have a huge ecosystem that has grown, um, not only around, I would say, Hadoop, but, you know, introducing a number of other capabilities. Um, so, what all of that is actually enabling and, and what he said today, which I really, um, which, which resonated with me is, is talking about digital transformation. And I know that's like kind of, um, you know, maybe an antiquated or maybe, you know, older uh, theme that we've heard before in the internet age. Um, but this time I would say there's, there's new merit here because, um, you know, what's fueling that transformation is, is the data um, and the value that you can gain from digitizing your business that you, know, that you can reap through data. Um, so that's exciting to me. Um, the other talk, uh, really quick, that I, I heard uh, this morning that I thought was great was Ian Andrews from Pivotal. And I think Pivotal was actually one of the earlier groups that focused on the application development side. Um, and as we all know, and I think as we'll all you know, appreciate, you know, building applications on Hadoop has, was never easy. Um, and now I would say, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the introduction of Spark, with Apache Spark, um, as well as, you know, a number of other folks that are um, coming together, there's a new, I would say, application development stack that, that's emerging. So on the digital transformation, be specific, because, you know, they've been talking yep. about ecosystem, open source innovation, that was part of his talk um, as well. And it seems to be the same message over and over again. Of course, it's open source, we love that. Um, but the notion of digital transformation really has to be rendered in the apps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're still waiting for the, the tsunami of apps to come, or are the apps already here? That's the debate we had yesterday. So yeah. I want to get your thoughts on that, because, you know, you go back to Hadoop World 2011, 2012, Mike Olson uh, was up there with uh, Ping Lee from Excel saying, mm -hmm. we're going to put a $100 million fund together for funding apps. Right. And so where are they? Or yeah. is it just native and everything? Well, I, I, would, I would argue that no individual vendor or investor, right, can um, bring together all of the bits and pieces to help a business become truly digital. Um, so our strategy, you know, over the past few years has really been, um, you know, to build an ecosystem of partners like, we, like we're doing with Apple, like we're doing with Box, um, like we did at first with the weather company until we acquired them. Um, so really partnering across to say, okay, you know, what are the key, you know, workflows and capabilities and frankly, you know, actions that our clients are taking that, you know, up until now are either paper-based or extremely manual or analog, right? The opposite of digital. Um, you know, what are all of those things that people are doing um, today that you could move to digital? And, you know, I would argue that, you know, my company, IBM, we're really in um, a great position uh, to bridge a lot of those gaps. So I would say to put a finer point on it, um, anywhere where there are paper-based processes, right? I mean, that's that's ripe for disruption. So one of the things I want to just highlight, because we covered with theCUBE uh, at Interconnect, your big uh, cloud show, um, was pretty apparent that the digitize everything message, well, that's not wasn't the formal message, but that was my takeaway, which is, you know, IBM is saying, look, everything's got to be digital. I mean, the full digital spectrum end-to-end -end is the 
the, the digital transformation. And I think yep. that is what you're saying. So can you just talk a little bit about that key message? Because I think Interconnect, you guys really highlighted this. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly Cognitive was front and center with the marketing and mm -hmm. you know, with Watson and all, but the underlying message was Blue Mix to enable essentially a digital everything culture. Yeah. Talk more about that. Yeah, I mean, the cloud is really um, another huge enabler, right? So we talk about the ubiquity of data and enable to store, you know, vast amounts of data um, very inexpensively with Hadoop now. I mean, that's, that's the value prop. And, you know, Amazon, of course, was one of the first to introduce us to cloud computing, um, at least at, at, a, at scale and at a reasonable cost. Um, but I, I would posit that where we're headed, and I know Google had their um, event just last week, and what I'm, I'm seeing um, emerge is, you know, really not necessarily just, you know, serving hard drives and processing as a service, um, but actually leaning more into, you know, a platform as a service, um, where that's where Bluemix comes in. And so, you know, we have, we're, we're the only, um, um, you know, offering out there on the market that actually you can build a mobile app, you know, using iOS, um, with Cognitive, with Hadoop, with Spark, with all of these um, emerging technologies in, in one place. And the Swift announcement you guys did with Apple is pretty important. I yep. want to get your take on, 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 on some specific points around that because, and then Peter, I'd like you to weigh in too, because as an analyst, you look at all the, all the different vendors and the impact of the customer, it's certainly multi-vendor. But in cutting speech, he, there was a, a quote, uh, I want to get your thoughts on the quote here. Mm -hmm. Long-term big data ecosystem around Hadoop may survive longer than Hadoop project itself. Oh yeah. So, so that essentially highlights what we've been seeing, which is it's not just about Hadoop. And some will argue that it's still not easy enough. And certainly we were saying that yesterday, yeah. it's got to get easier. But what's interesting around the ecosystem, it's not just Hadoop, it's people who have come around Hadoop mm -hmm. who are doing other things. So I want to get your guys' thoughts on that. Uh, Joel, we'll start with you. That ecosystem, certainly sure. sustainable, it's, it's active, it's all smart people, and they're doing a variety of things, but it's not just about Hadoop. You see Spark and other things. Your thoughts on that comment? Yeah, so we recognized that um, last year when we announced Spark, which is one of the reasons why we had a community-first approach. Um, we opened up the Spark Technology Center in San Francisco, um, and it's not composed of simply Hadoop and Spark experts. It also includes um, you know, domain-specific uh, experts, as well as designers, as well as business users. Um, so I think what I would interpret that comment as is that it's not going to be, you know, focused on Hadoop primarily, and it's going to expand even beyond Hadoop, um, is talking about the different people, frankly, that are part of this community. I mean, geez, there's like 5,000 people over there, right? They're not all data scientists. I couldn't, you know, how many times did I hear speakers say, and you data scientists, I'm like, I'm not a data scientist, right? So we're, we need to get to a point where we're building applications that can actually, you know, translate data science to, you know, to a common um, person or to an industry specific uh, person, right? So, or, you know, mm -hmm. that's where I, I see, that's how I interpret this ecosystem um, evolving. And in fact, uh, just yesterday, um, we released our community um, partner program. So if you go to community.spark.tc, um, we have around a dozen or so um, new ecosystem members like, you know, the makers of Kafka, Confluent, you know, H2O um, with machine learning, um, Datto, you know, with their machine learning APIs. So this ecosystem is, is growing at a tremendous speed and, and we're just, you know, trying to um, facilitate the conversation. Yeah, what I'd say about that, and I, I, think, you're, I think you're absolutely right, Joel, uh, but how I would extend that is uh, the idea that there is, uh, that every tool has a certain pedagogy associated with it. Um, and what the ecosystem is focused on is solving the problems. Yep. And the, there's this interesting cycle between identifying the problem and coming up with the technology that can solve it, and then discovering that the technology can be applied to new problems, but mm -hmm. not quite, and extending the technology, and this cycle is going to go on. And Hadoop is, in many respects, the first pebble that was thrown into this vast lake of digital business problems mm -hmm. that are, and, and the ripples are going through, and eventually they'll disperse, but people will say, okay, with that experience, we can now do something that involves streaming, mm -hmm. and then we can do something that involves something else. Mm -hmm. So the ecosystem gets catalyzed by the, the, the problems that can be solved. And it's, and increasingly that's what we're going to be focusing on, is how can we take these technologies and apply them to new problems, 
What are the limits of the technology? How do we create new stuff in the process? Get that back out into the ecosystem. And so he's absolutely right. You know, uh, we'll remember Hadoop forever, and it may, and it will probably be here in some form yeah. forever. But in 10 years, what we're going to be talking about is a new class of technology because we will be trying to solve vastly different and more complex and perhaps more interesting types so of So diversity problems. is a key thing, Joel. You guys have a diverse approach. And talk about that, your, your thoughts on that. Because IBM is not a, it used to be big blue, blue, blue everything. Yep. But now you have openness, you have some differentiation, certainly yep. with Watson and a variety of other things. So talk about IBM's uh, open yet differentiate strategy, because you guys have been doing open source. IBM has been doing open source, again, do for 10 years, but yeah. it goes way back. Yeah. I mean, the stuff that you guys are doing is pretty phenomenal, but talk about the diversity, why it's important to have diversity in, in, the, uh, in the ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that the short answer is um, that without diversity, you can really only solve a handful of, of, of challenges, right? And so you really need to bring in different um, points of view into every kind of discussion. Um, and, and it's no difference now when you talk about data and, and the digital um, business, and even now that we talk about the cognitive business, um, there's a lot of interpretation that needs to happen, and there's many ways to interpret things. Um, I, would, I would argue that you know, it's not necessarily, I mean, certainly we are committed to open source, no question, um, but I would actually move, um, I, would, I would position a different way where we talk about an open kind of community or an open framework. So I think what, you know, what we're doing with, say, Watson and how we've um, opened up a number of our APIs and not just opened them up and kind of threw them over the wall to the community, which I see a lot of people doing lately, yep. um, we actually make them usable to application developers. So if you go into Bluemix, you, know, you can choose from you know, over you know, 30 different cognitive APIs. Um, and use them in your application tomorrow. You know, in fact, internally, um, we're running what's called a cognitive build contest right now, where you know, hundreds and thousands of IBMers are building machine learning apps that have no experience like with doing machine learning. Right? They're able to go into Bluemix, you know, grab those APIs, pull them into an application, and basically prototype stuff for inside of IBM for actually creating some really you know, unique um, opportunities for us. So it's, it's, really, it's really a cool era that we're in right now. So uh, I, Joel, I'm fascinated by what you're saying because uh, we were talking, uh, in fact, during the introduction about uh, how the big boys sometimes don't get the credit for innovation that they deserve. Mm -hmm. There is an enormous amount of invention that takes place. We saw a lot of great, very inventive companies yesterday, but the idea of creating APIs, not just throwing them over the wall, right. but getting the community to engage with those APIs, That's right. taking on the task of servicing and supporting them so that everybody changes their behaviors or adopts the new behaviors that are likely to lead to yep. dramatically new business levels of business value. That's always been a strength of a company like IBM. Mm -hmm. But how do, you, how, do you how do you put together that need to serve the community mm -hmm. through open source, mm -hmm. and at the same time, uh, take on these challenging, very expensive and complex tasks yeah. that require a fair amount of money. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a matter of, look, open source is here to stay. I think innovation is happening, well, the best innovation is happening when many you know, experts from multiple organizations come together and collaborate, right? Whether that be over open source technology or an open project, um, I, I see that's just basically the future. And I, I would, you know, where we provide value and where we create value is by bringing, you know, I think a unique viewpoint to every problem, right, that we, that we encounter. Um, so that, that's what's really exciting to me is that, you know, by and large, by us opening up, you know, IBM, frankly, to work with more of the community, um, it means that we're going to get exposure to a lot more challenges that many businesses are facing. Um, that you know, really, I would say that IBM is one of the few people that can really solve because we're able to attack problems from so many different angles. So, how do you uh, how do you sustain uh, the, the the fact that you're trying that you're going to become a hub within mm -hmm. the community? through which an enormous amount of knowledge sharing is going to happen. There's going to be a lot of knowledge flowing through IBM. Yep. How do you then take that, grab that, and turn it into new capabilities yeah. while protecting your customer's intellectual property? Yeah. Because we're, talking, we're, we're not talking about putting in place accounting packages that everybody's going to do relatively commonly. Yeah. We're talking about altering your operations, engaging your markets yep. very differently. How do, you, how do you sustain that tension? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. Um, you know, it's and it isn't. It's it's not. Um, you know, it's not an obvious. There's no obvious answer. I think it's just maintaining that relationship and being very transparent, frankly, with you know, with your with our clients as well as with the community, um, and being very clear about you know what we ask them to share or not share, right? And I actually, what you're seeing in the industry today, you know, if you look at Uber and if you look at Airbnb and if you look at um, a lot of the leading companies, I mean they are open with sharing their architectures, right? The real IP, I think, is, is not about the technology stack. I think that's like a common misconception. The real IP is actually applying that stack to solve real business problems. And for those, I mean, you know, you can put your ear to the ground and hear, you know, what some folks are doing. But, you know, by and large, I mean, that lives, that's, that's kind of a, um, you know, a cultural kind of thing within a lot of our clients' companies, right? So I'll talk about the show here. We've got a couple more minutes. I want to get your thoughts on what you're working on, yeah. what IBM is doing at the show. What's the focus for IBM here uh, at Big Data Week, Big Data SV and Strata Hadoop? What, is, what are you guys looking at? What are you looking yep. at for deals? What's on your agenda? What are you looking for? What's surprising you? Just your thoughts on IBM in general. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say the most disruptive um, mega trend or theme, if you want to call that, um, you know, that we see is, is the cloud. I think that's actually what... Um, could disrupt Hadoop the most. So if you look at, say, you know, our, um, you know, Spark as a service on Bluemix, um, you know, it doesn't use Hadoop, right? It runs on our own, um, you know, uh, uh, resource manager that sits on top of the Swift object store. And we've made a ton of enhancements to make it extremely fast and extremely proficient. But there's no Hadoop in sight there, right? And the, and the same can go for, for other vendors. So that to me is an interesting scenario because, you know, you start looking at, okay, cloud just creates different economics, different dynamics. Um, and actually, Adam Koklowski is going to give a really cool talk tomorrow, um, one of his keynotes, where he's going to talk explicitly about it, what it takes to work within, you know, open source, what it takes to work within, um, you know, the cloud environment. These are non-trivial challenges. I think Hadoop has grown and has done really well, but predominantly on-premise, right? I, I don't hear much from, say, Cloudera, MapR, Hortonworks, um, or frankly, many vendors, Hadoop vendors, um, talking about the cloud. And so, to me, I think that's where we go hockey stick, right, into the next couple years is, you know, moving to the cloud and helping our clients, you know, create not just cloud environments, but hybrid cloud environments. Now, when you say cloud, are you really saying simplification? Um, you know, I would love to say that if it were so simple. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the idea yeah. of taking some of the technology administrative sh administration True. challenges out and let somebody else manage them so the developers and users can yes. get to the value. That is true. I would say that a lot of the complexity in managing a Hadoop cluster, and in fact, that's a good segue into the ODPI, um, we actually announced that you know, we released a test harness and um, the first certification. And so if you look at Hadoop, it's made up of over 30 different projects. So managing that on premise is, you know, is, is painful, but you're right, as you move to the cloud, I mean, a lot of that will be automated behind the scenes, right? Yeah, and we'll making it simpler. I mean, that's just a, <clears throat> just one of those things that everyone's chipping away at every day is making it easier. I mean, that's we're hearing that loud and clear. A lot of cracks in the foundation, um, but that's just more time-based. Got to get it done over time. Yeah, and I think you know, sorry, just to add to that, and and kind of as a as a as an aside, you know, what I actually there's a myth that I, I want to dispel where people actually think you need Hadoop to use Spark. Like a lot of the presentations I see, it's like, okay, you got to build your cluster and get all your data in there and build the lake first and then you can get to spark it's like that's not at all true like you can actually spin up a spark cluster you know before you ever touch Hadoop, right so and i would actually highly recommend it because that's a far faster time to value you know um you know, direction than I would necessarily saying, you know, investing heavily in in a cluster, in my opinion. Joel, thanks for spending the time coming by first thing in the morning here on theCUBE, you know, bringing the energy, uh, day two coverage. <laughs> um, thanks for coming on, great insight, and, and congratulations on your new role as you guys expand and continue to do well with, with uh, big data and, and certainly the cloud. We've seen that a lot of great traction. Of course, Watson is, you know, the headliner of all the conversations. You know, cognitive conversation is the platform. All these kinds of things are booming. It's all data-driven. This is theCUBE. We'll be right back with more coverage after this short break.